Welcome back, everybody, to the Club Metaverse podcast. Today, I am very, very lucky to be joined by sports broadcasting legend already, and he's a you know a young man, Mr. John Anik. Uh, I almost called you a thespian because the you know your your orating skills are at an incredible level. I, I mean, I've talked to writers and and actors, directors, scientists, and and I'm amazed by how quickly and elegantly you improvise your words in high pressure situations. How how did you develop that? Just to get right into it, like how, where, where did that come about? Well, thank you, man. I appreciate the introduction and certainly the kind words. I think for a lot of us, maybe we don't wanna lean into the fact that we might have some natural ability. <laughs> and I hearken back to when LeBron James said he was gonna take his talents to South Beach and how right. off-putting a phrase that was to all of us, right? And I never sort of leaned into that until I was probably in my early 40s. And I said, you know what, maybe I was, go ahead. Not to me because I'm a, I'm a huge Miami Heat fan. So, so when right. that- Well, you were good. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, and I get it, right? But I guess when I was 41, I sort of said, all right, you know, maybe I have some natural orating ability, but when I was, in my formative years, at least journalistically, when I was going from print journalism to radio and eventually to television, I felt like my print, my prose was clean, it was clear, but mm. verbally maybe I had a little bit of an advantage over my peers, whereas from a writing standpoint, they could write circles around me. So certainly it's been honed over 20 plus years. I'm an identical twin, and we actually do an NFL podcast together called Annex Squared. And I've said to people privately, the only reason I'm a modicum better than that dude, even though he's a classically trained musical theater guy, is because I got 25 years in the business and he maybe has two years. So repetitions are king. I don't have to tell you that, but I do think maybe I had some God-given ability just to orate. And a uh, big part of my challenge, to your point, has been to sort of slow down my yeah. delivery because my brain I think wants to go quickly, especially when I'm reading a promo in the middle of mixed martial arts action. So always a challenge for me and I'm sure I'll retire this way to slow my myself down. But uh, but I appreciate the kind words, brother. Yeah, so I um, I'm obviously an avid listener of the Anik and Florian podcast and I'm very, very familiar with that. I didn't know that you do an NFL podcast out of curiosity. Who's your team? Well, born and raised in Massachusetts, yeah, so you're probably not going to like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I know we've taken you in. I live in Florida also. I mean, I actually just moved from L.A. not too long ago, so I don't want to act like, you know, I've been here forever. But I did grow up here. We've taken you in. I thought maybe you'd give the Dolphins a little love, but no way, right? AFC East rivals, I'm assuming. I have, well, I have softened as a sports fan as I've gotten older. So certainly mm -hmm. for some of the more starved fan bases out there, Toronto Maple Leafs, Miami Dolphins, there's a small pot of my hat that's rooting for you. But as a Boston guy and as a former Patriot season ticket holder in the 70s and 80s, Mark, mm, right? I mean, cool. we grew up watching Dan Marino come in there and it was just a matter of how many you guys were going to beat the Patriots by. So we put in our time. Thankfully, it has turned a corner. And uh, yeah, I'll be a Patriots fan diehard until I die, brother. Well, good for you, man. But I, um, one of the most painful sport experiences in my life was that uh, I believe the game took place in 85, that uh, AFC championship, or maybe it was, I don't know if it was the championship, but it was an AFC playoff game against the Patriots with that eventually you guys went on to play the Bears, you know, in the year that Dan Marino had beat the Bears on that fame Monday night game. Yeah. And, and that to me is the worst loss as a Dolphins fan I've ever received. And it came at the hands of now, in retrospect, a mediocre Patriots team after the six, seven Super Bowls or whatever you guys went on to win. But during that time, that Patriots team kind of shocked the world by going to the Super Bowl. I believe Steve Grogan was the yeah, quarterback. Yeah, Steve Grogan, yep. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, that was a tough one for me as a Dolphins fan. Yeah, there were a lot of lean years, of course, for the Patriots. And it's interesting you talk about that particular team not being a great outfit. And you're absolutely right, because even though the Patriots won six Super Bowls recently mm -hmm. and were very thankful for that, there were a lot of years they didn't win at all when they oh. did have the best team. So the best team doesn't often win. But you're right, that Patriots team, it was sort of a mirage that they even got that far. Yeah, so so um, how you your, your sports journalism background um, was focused on – the big sports versus the sort of uh, combat sports? And how did you make that transition? 
Yeah, so thankfully when I was about 16 years old, I knew I wanted to work in sports. Initially, I, I thought I would be a columnist for the Boston Globe, and then the goal sort of shifted to radio, and I wanted to be on this 50,000-watt juggernaut in Boston called Sports Radio 850 WEEI. But the combat sports thing sort of happened organically. I was hosting an afternoon drive show in Boston. We're talking Red Sox, Celtics, Patriots, a little Bruins here and there. <laughs> 1510 The Zone, Sporting News Radio affiliate in Boston. And I got an opportunity to co-host the Mouthpiece Boxing Show. And mm. therein developed a love for me for combat sports, boxing at the time. I didn't grow up watching boxing with my father, none of that. I didn't grow up watching martial arts movies. But once I started covering boxing, I really got into it. And then a few years later, I found myself at ESPN headquarters in Bristol, Connecticut, and they were launching a show called MMA Live. And I was one of the few guys under that roof that had anything resembling a combat sports background. It was mm. like me and Brian Kenny and Stuart Scott and candidly a, di a little digital media outfit called MMA Live on ESPN.com was not going to get someone like Brian Kenny nor Stuart Scott at the time. So I started hosting MMA Live in 2008. That was the impetus to uh, to get the chance to do Bellator season one, play by play in 2009. And then I joined the UFC a few years later in 2011. So it happened organically, albeit surprisingly. I never thought I would be working in combat sports, but I'm certainly glad that uh, this was the wagon that I decided to hitch myself to. Yeah, that's awesome. And, and you know, um, for people sort of my age and, and especially my audience that might, you know, is a big video game audience. You know, there's a lot of gaming going on. Um, the UFC game has probably been a bit more popular than the actual UFC for quite some time. Maybe not anymore because the UFC has blown up so much. But in the early days, the UFC was like, yeah, I've heard about it. It's on a few channels, but the game is cool. Let's play the game. And the game, of course, for many, many years was dominated by, uh, you know, Mr. Goldberg's voice. And it became this sort of iconic part of, what ufc fighting was at least to the kind of gaming culture that i'm a part of right but you have come in and completely sort of indiana jones style replaced one golden thing with the other without any break How, what was that like i'm sure it wasn't easy at first because of such an iconic kind of voice and such an iconic tone to now completely have you know i don't know if replace is the right word but sort of um sort of evolved it or, or sort of grown it to what it is today. Was that a challenge for you sort of intellectually in the back of your head? Yes. And even now, right, I feel like I want to earn that seat every show out. I want to work harder than the guy that's coming up trying to take my job. And I do think I work harder than a lot of my contemporaries. But when I left ESPN in 2011, <clears throat> There were a lot of people in my life, Mark, who said, it took you forever to get to ESPN. You finally broke the door down. Now you're leaving. And now, 12 years later, you can argue, had I stayed at ESPN, I might have done an NFL football game, which is a box I haven't checked, right? So right, right. I You'd believe be great I... at that, by the way. You'd well, thank you. Great at that. Thank you. I believe <laughs> I made the right decision, but I'd be lying if I said there wouldn't always be this NFL pull. I also, <clears throat> excuse me, wouldn't have left if I didn't think that I eventually could ascend and be the number one guy with the UFC. I didn't expect it would happen as expeditiously as it did. I was with the UFC for four or five years before I was elevated to become the number one guy. But I certainly wouldn't have taken that opportunity and taken that risk if I didn't think that I could eventually work with Joe Rogan and be the number one guy. But I've always stayed true to who I am and what I am, right? I'm not a jiu-jitsu practitioner. I'm not a lifelong martial artist. I'm a classically trained broadcaster, and I don't have a lot of shtick. I don't have a lot of catchphrases, right? I wasn't going to come in here and come up with some sort of token <clears throat> phrase to cap every fight. <laughs> right. I've had to be who I am, and to whatever degree I think it's resonated well, with the fan base. So You do have one token phrase that I think is absolutely wonderful, and I look forward to it in every press conference that, that you do, which is – you know, the one more sleep. I'm not sure if that's like, if we can say that that's an anic, but that's pretty much an anic phrase, right? Yeah, and that sort of took took off and took on a life of its own. It's nothing that I use during fight commentary, but you will hear me on a weigh-in stage the <laughs> night, before, <laughs> night before a big pay-per-view say one more sleep. Yeah, but, I love that, by the way. It's a great, it's a great well, notion because it's like, it reminds me of Christmas, right? When you used to say, there's only a right. few more sleeps till Christmas. 
Well, and candidly, it applies to a lot of different things. When I wear the One More Sleep merchandise that we sell to go pick up my kid at elementary school, they think it means something entirely different, right? <laughs> so, yeah, I think that it is something not unlike Bruce Buffer's It's Time. It can be used in a lot of different walks of life. But when it comes to actually capping the fights and of ending course. the fights, if you get too much in your own head, then you really jeopardize giving historical context to these moments that really need it, right? I'm providing the soundtrack for these men and women's professional lives. Mm -hmm. And so when a fighter breaks through and becomes a UFC champion for the first time, and I say this with all due respect to my predecessor, but it's a lot easier to just say, oh, it's all over, that's it, right? Or as opposed to giving the moment something in that moment organically, mm -hmm. like Poland, your guy got it done, right? Mm -hmm. And so now Jan Bohovic has that for the rest of his life. and. You know, I think it means something to his family. So I've tried really hard to create calls that will withstand the test of time. We don't always get them perfectly, but um, that is the goal. And especially am hyper-focused on that when it comes to uh, the championship fights that I've been afforded the opportunity to call. Yeah, and, you know, for me, um, my sort of UFC um, kind of um, evolution has started from you know, okay, I'll check out the Conor McGregor, um, you know, Khabib fight. And then, you know, like I caught it a little bit early because I paid for the pre-preview and I saw the, you know, the Ferguson fight, you know, that was right before that was also great. And slowly but surely, especially during the pandemic in full transparency, I've become a every single pay-per-view purchaser. Like I yes. am, I'm a power user. Like there is no huh. option. Like, even if it's one in Utah or if it's here, or if it's there, I don't give a crap who's on the card. I'm buying the pay-per-view. I've become Amazing. that guy. Is it 50 bucks? Is it 60 bucks? Is it 80 bucks? Who, who cares, right? It's, it's something I'm going to buy. And my point is that once you become that level of, I think, UFC watcher, you realize that you guys are there for five to six to seven hours on the mic not like not just in the production but you'll literally do five six hours of commentating all of these fights how do you prepare enough to give to your point the respect to each of those fighters that you're aware of who they are and what they're fighting for in the ring even if it's fight number one or the yeah. main event well, it, it gives me chills to hear you set that up because I do believe during the pandemic, we acquired a lot of new fans, especially domestically here in the United States. And the fact that we have gained your paper viewership for life seemingly <laughs> is a really cool thing for me to hear. So I'm not blowing smoke when I say it actually gave me chills to hear you set it up that way. Mm -hmm. As far as the challenge of this broadcast, it's unlike anything in professional sports. Mm -hmm. It's essentially doing back-to-back -back Super Bowls every time we crack a mic. We do 41 shows a year. I do 25 of those shows. And it's eight hours minimum on a headset. And we ask a lot of our fans all over the world to maybe wake up in the middle of the night and ingest these sporting events. And a lot of our fans, unlike you, maybe are ingesting all 41 of these events times seven hours per Saturday. It's a huge undertaking. Thankfully, at this point, it's the devil I know, and I have enough repetitions to get through these shows. But mm. you do have to build up stamina. You do have to leave room in your register as the fights get bigger, as the night goes on. As far as the preparation goes... It's probably going to be the early death of me, Mark, right? Like, I always <laughs> bemoan the fact that I don't have enough time to prep, right. right? We went to a 15-fight card during the global pandemic, right? And that mm. was a protection mechanism in the event that we lost a few fights, then we would still be able to salvage 11 or 12. Right. The result now is that we have 15-fight pay-per-views and we're not losing fights. So I'm charged with prepping 30 fighters. So saying nothing about show formatics and the copy that I write for the pay-per-view open. When you see fighters in a locker room, right? I'm writing that copy. I want to maximize those 15 seconds. Forgetting all of the show formatics. How much time am I giving those 30 athletes just to know their backstory, to watch film, to take sure. notes, to learn how many kids they have, to learn their why, to watch their last fight, all of that. How much am I giving per athlete when I have 30 fights on a card? So. You can sort of hear the anxiety as I talk about the preparation <laughs> and none of my anxiety with this job is in the performance. Once I get to fight night, Mark, I'm good, but the preparation is going to be the death of me, bro. I'm telling you. Do you, do you, because I know that, you know, obviously you're the pay-per-view guy and we're all very thankful for that. 
um, and your your sort of squad, um, your your color guys, because even though it's not a one for one, you're the play by play, and then you have your two sort of color commentaries, typically in 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 this sort of new format that went from two to three. Right. Um, and you know, of course, you work with the great Joe Rogan and the great DC, and that's kind of like the starting team, right? You know, that's the A squad. Uh, but then you also work with Michael Bispin. You you know you also work with Dominic Cruz, who's one of my personal favorites. Like there's some kind of weird poetic elegance oh. to every word he says as well. You know, which is quite amazing. Like, do you also sort of prep with them and 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 in unison with them? Because you know, I can only imagine that you know, as somebody who's worked in film and in theater. There's an element and an art form to to the balance of improvisation. You guys are doing this for six, seven hours. Is there some kind of unwritten rule that you guys have with each other to know when you know the mic is hot? To use one of another one of your quotes. Yeah. Well, chemistry, I think, is something that you will develop pretty quickly, and you'll kind of either have it or you won't with a broadcast team. I think I've worked with 18 or so different mm. broadcast combinations in my time with the UFC, but I remember the first time I worked with Joe Rogan on short notice, three days notice in 2012, to fill mm. in for Mike Goldberg on a pay-per-view, and either had chemistry at UFC 155 or you don't, right? <laughs> and I think we did, humbly if I can say that. So sometimes I wish I had more time so, with my broadcast partners during fight week. Go ahead. So just because I am going to go to UFC Fight Pass, you know, plug uh, and check this fight. Is that the first one you ever did? Was UFC 155? That was the first pay-per-view I did sort of on a moment's notice. The first mm. fight card I ever did and... Gosh, Mark, you're going to cringe when you watch this back. But it was January 20th, 2012, UFC Fight Night, Jim Miller versus Melvin Gillard. And actually, Habib Nurmagomedov made his UFC debut the same night that I was on oh, the wow. sticks I'm going to check out time. both. So, yeah. So, so, so 155 and UFC Fight Night again? Gillard versus Miller. Gallard versus Miller. I'm going to watch both of those, man. This is great. First of all, so, I should have watched them to prep for this. But well, sorry, go ahead. No, you're good. So... When I started calling fights with Daniel Cormier in 2016, mm, when he crazy. was added to the broadcast team, I would go to his room and we would sort of rehearse the walkouts because he wanted to do that. When Brian Stam was my broadcast partner, we spent every waking moment together, every meal. We were constantly sharing our notes. I remember early on in my time with Brian Stam, I showed up to lunch and I didn't have my notes. And he's like, what are you doing? You think we're talking about girls? Like, where are your notes, right? So we have the fighter meetings, obviously, and my analysts are a part of that. But sometimes I wish that there was a little bit more of that Joe Buck, Troy Aikman mm. uniformity during fight week where we would all spend time together. Um, but I do think that there's a lot that's asked of my broadcast partners and myself during some of these fight weeks, and we all sort of prep differently. I would say Dominic Cruz is the one guy that I'm probably the closest with and oh, the really? guy whose hotel room that I still prep in. So we oftentimes will still prep together. He'll watch film while I'm writing notes, and, uh, and I cherish that time because I don't have it with all my broadcast partners, that's for sure. Yeah, man, Dominic Cruz... Um... Because when I really started getting into it, like I said, like, look, I'm a bit of a latecomer, even though I'm super hardcore now. Like, you know, now I like, you know, I, I listen to your podcast, obviously, you know, Ariel, I'm really good buddies with Michael Rappaport. He gives me shout outs on Ariel's podcast. Like, so I, I'm a recent arrival, but, you know, like, like everything I do in life, I tend to go in pretty, pretty hardcore. Um, how, like, do, do you sort of separate you know, because the thing about the UFC is that you start to fall in love with these characters, right? It's very different than being a fan of a team, you know? Um, and sometimes it's hard. And look, a lot of people get a little bit of slack for this, right? A lot of commentators, oh, he's biased towards this guy. He's biased towards that guy. Everybody gets it. It's not exclusive to one broadcaster or another. Every, every broadcaster has gotten this. How do you try to keep that sort of distance in your sort of commentating to like not subtext root for the guy, you know, because it's tough, right? Because these are human beings. The, you know, this isn't the Washington Redskins and the Oakland Raiders. I mean, this is human beings with their own story and their own narrative. Yeah. And sometimes you just can't help that. You know, how do you try to separate that? Well, I think Stipe Miocic knows when I'm calling that trilogy between him and my broadcast partner and dear friend Daniel Cormier that my heart is with DC. Mm. But 
in actuality, Stipe and I maybe have the longer relationship, right? right. So there's love on both sides. Dominic Cruz is probably my best friend on the roster. Cheeto Vera is probably top five in terms of the guys that I'm closest with. Now, they fought each other. Thankfully, I didn't get the assignment. But the hardest things for me certainly are when my broadcast partners are involved. But I got to tell you, Mark, as soon as they walk out, and the event starts, the last thing I'm thinking about is any sort of friendship. And maybe my right. subconscious gives them less credit and gives their opponent more credit, if anything. But I take criticism, constructive or otherwise, pretty seriously from fighters and coaches especially. And there's not a show that goes by where maybe I'm not trying to put out some fire or at least trying to address or acknowledge some criticism that has come my way. We had right. a recent example where I thought Mark Goddard, the referee, let a fight go too long, and my broadcast partners weren't necessarily hammering the moment the way I thought it needed to be, so mm. I maybe stepped out of my lane a little bit and analyzed and editorialized, and lo and behold, Mark Goddard sends me a private message um, acknowledging that my criticism was, was harsh but fair and just. Mm. So, you know, sometimes it's a positive thing, sometimes it's a negative thing, but candidly, my man, not a show goes by where someone isn't upset with something. And uh, oh, of course, that's the it, UFC. It is what it is. Yeah, which is, look, to be honest with you, it's part of the secret sauce, right? Like, the fact that there is so much sub, like, it, you know, you know, it's really funny because everybody talks about fighting in the UFC is that it's the truth in there, right? Like, like, uh, you know, two two human beings going at it you know, the truth will be revealed in there, right? And the truth is something that we see as quite objective. But the reality is, is that the UFC is this crazy balance of incredibly objective, right? The knockout, the TKO, the fight stoppage, the obvious defeat to the incredibly subjective, right? Which, you know, this weekend, for example, with your, you know, friend, you know, Chito Vera, you know, I'm sure you saw the fight. I'm sure you were rooting for him. But he clearly lost that fight and lost it, you know, potentially five rounds to none. One judge gives him the entire fight, you know? So it's like, it's this incredible blend of objectivism with subjectivism that creates this, you know, I'm kind of rambling, but this mosh of, of drama, you know, which yeah. is ultimately yeah. what, you know, you know, what happens. It is. It's the greatest unpredictable theater in the world. And even after a relatively one-sided main event, right? As we crack a mic on our podcast today, we have all this to talk about because sure. one judge thought that Cheeto Vera won rounds three, four, and five. So when I say to you that not a show goes by in which I'm not putting out a fire thereafter, <laughs> not a week goes by on probably your podcast if it was all about MMA or mine where there isn't something crazy to talk about, right? I had Colby right. Covington, local fighter here in South Florida, sure, come sure. at me last week on a Tuesday totally out of the blue. Right? Sure, sure. You know, sure. and that all of a sudden impacts my family's life profoundly, right? And yeah. that's something that candidly your average football or basketball announcer is just not dealing with. So, right, uh, right. And that's okay. You know, I don't know that I'd have it which, any which other Which is way. heartbreaking to me because, look, just like, and my audience is mostly a gaming and science audience anyway, but Colby Covington is one of my favorite fighters, just in full disclosure. But I know that Colby Covington, you know, because, like, I'm from Miami and, you know, we, we have some similar friends. Like, Colby Covington would never do anything, you know, to even like, you know, he probably loves you. He probably like worships you, you know, but he's obviously like gone so deep into this concept of the theater side of MMA that like somehow you ended up like, yeah. like in the mix, which is just wild. And I wouldn't be surprised if Chael Sonnen himself like said, hey, man, you should probably go after Andy because he's the nicest guy in the sport. <laughs> Yeah, well, but like it was, sometimes, sometimes it, it's like you, you don't know if it's real or not, right? Exactly, right. So, yeah. and I'm only giving this to you, right? I mean, I don't even know that I am going to address this anywhere else. I might address it on my podcast, but when something like that happens, where Colby Covington publicly takes issue with something that I've said, and then goes on to threaten my family to whatever okay. degree, I really didn't feel any sort of appreciable threat for the record, right? I didn't even think twice, if I'm being honest, until my phone started blowing up like crazy, okay? <laughs> but there's two different things at play. Sure. Did I say something critically that he's really taken issue with, either on the post-fight show where I'm paid as an analyst or on the pay-per-view after the fact, on my podcast? Did he take issue with me just giving Bilal Muhammad a platform? Sure. Right? I have to address that and focus on that, and then we can deal with whatever perceived threat there may be. So as far as me saying something 
uh, there wasn't anything inflammatory that I had said, but I had to make sure that with the athlete, I made sure that there was nothing that was going to prevent me from either having a fighter meeting with him in the future or doing my job, calling the championship fight that Samuel he's going to be involved in. So, and then I can deal with the threat. Yeah. So that's the way it was handled. And, uh, we're all good. Yeah. And, 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 and like for the record, and I think that this is maybe look, and now I'm, you know, highly editorializing here. But I think where Colby started getting a little bit defensive is that, you know, Bilal, remember the name Muhammad, who at first I'm like, who is this guy? I'm not really that interested in him. To his credit, has started to understand probably better than any other fighter on the roster, the Colby Covington playbook. You know, so he starts to kind of create his own little incendiary little dialogue. Right. And, and actually has probably done more self-promotion in that weight class than anybody besides Colby Covington, you know? So respect, to, you know, respect to Bilal and, you know, Colby, Colby is just like, you know, he's, he's the heel. Um, but look, hopefully, obviously it's all, a, I think personally, it's all a joke and, you know, I can't wait to see those two in the ring. I mean, that's the, you know, that's the net oh, yeah. result of all of this. Right. Right. <laughs> right. And uh, hopefully they'll remove me from the uh, promotional <laughs> hyperbole during fight week. But right. when Bilal Muhammad started a video podcast with my twin brother, and that's part right. of the rub too, because sure, Bilal is sure. like family, right? But Colby, to your point, one of my favorite fighters of all time, we had a cordial, amicable interaction in London that he referenced sort of right, when right, he was right. talking trash. Yeah, yeah. But when Bilal launched that, that podcast, yeah. But when Bilal launched that podcast, he had like 10,000 Instagram followers. Now he has 356,000 followers on Instagram. And a lot of that has been self-promotion and understanding how to resonate with people. Now, there's still a huge segment of the fan base that just doesn't like him. They don't like hearing from him and that's fine. But I agree with you in terms of self-promotion other than Colby, I'm not sure anybody's done it any better than Bilal. So, you know, let me ask you like, um, you know, first of all, thank you for sharing that with me because it gives me a little bit of a peek behind the curtains. Um, because like you said, you three guys were the headline of not Leon Edwards, not this, not that. It was Colby, Bilal, and Anik, right? <laughs> Which is like like, like a beautiful part of, of the sort of MMA drama. But to put all that aside for a second, when you sort of think about your career that you've built in this world of, of, of UFC, currently, what's that top moment as a broadcaster that you, like when you close your eyes, and you think of the highs, it's the one that always goes to the top of the list. Well, when I answer this way, a lot of people may allege recency bias, but Leon Edwards beat Kamar Usman at UFC 278 mm -hmm. last August, and right before he landed the head kick, I sort of was trying to dismiss this moral victory narrative that had been established during the broadcast, and I uttered, yeah, but that's just not the cloth from which he is cut, and then he knocked him Oof, out with the head I kick. Know, and I know, got chills, Jake. yeah, that was... That was crazy. It was crazy, and a lot of it was just good fortune. And, you know, so Dana White approached me on stage as that feature was running in London a couple weeks ago, and he was like, dude, that's the call of your career. And uh, mm. I said, hey, I got lucky. He said, well, you throw enough out there, you hit one like that, that call's going to withstand <laughs> the test of time. So that was a really special moment for me to have with the boss. So it's hard for me to put any moment above that. I think certainly collectively for me and Joe in D.C., when Rose Namajunas broke through and knocked mm. out Ioana Yim Jacek in New York, that was a special moment. There have been so many, right? Like oftentimes right, my, right. my cop-out answer is just go back and look at any fight in which someone as a non-champion breaks through and becomes a first-time UFC champion, whether it's Brandon Moreno, the aforementioned Jan mm. Blachowicz, any of these men or women. I try to really give it to them good when they win a title for the first time. And that's uh, awesome. those are the most special moments for me. You know, for me, like that one broadcast announcement, and I'm not even a St. Louis Cardinals fan or a Mark McGuire fan, but it's Joe Buck saying, how much more can you give us Big Mac number 70? It is just for some reason, it's always stuck with me. Is there one or a few that have always stuck with you from other broadcasters? Well, certainly do you, Joe Castiglione when the Red Sox on the radio, mm. do you believe it when the Red Sox won the World Series in oh, 04? God, now I'm getting sucked. chills. Or, um, yeah, yeah. And then even just the simplicity of Pat Summerall, may he rest in peace when Adam Vinatieri kicked the field goal. Mm. And my late UFC pay-per-view producer, Bruce Connell, would always say to me, less is more. We're not doing radio. We are doing television. And we do have pictures that we can lean on. 
So sometimes a call can be as simple as Adam Venateri, it's good, or fourth round TKO, and that's all you need. And if you punctuate it the right way and maybe inflect the right way, maybe your voice cracks and that adds to the moment, you know? So less is more. And a lot of those championship calls when the Patriots or the Red Sox broke through, some of the simplest calls in professional sports history, but they really set the tone. And, and, and do you do you analyze that like you know the way that you know sort of you know Picasso always said that the greatest uh, you know uh, you know like you know that imitation is is flattery that all yeah. his work is copied and like et cetera et cetera. Do you um, take a lot from some of your favorite broadcasters consciously, or is it like do you like to study to see if there's a new angle, a new approach, something that you could bring into your own you know sort of oration so sean mcdonough national play-by-play -play guy is the guy that i probably modeled myself most after because i grew up listening to him and such a funny prick off the air right mm. and sometimes he will let that out and i sometimes will try to let my comedy out a little bit on the podcast and certainly increasingly on the broadcast as i've gotten more comfortable and my bosses have gotten more comfortable with me uh but joe rogan right like when i mm. go mc away in Imitation, right, is the greatest form of flattery. I have sure. essentially modeled my way in. Interesting. Persona after him, right? Because I really appreciate the way he connects with a live audience. Obviously, he's done it through stand up comedy, it's his vehicle for years, but. Just coming up, what's up folks? Welcome to the weigh-in and immediately grabbing an audience by the ball. So I have right. told Joe as much that I have modeled myself after him and I hope he takes that as the utmost compliment. I'm a huge Joe Rogan fan. I've actually met him a few times because I used to work pretty closely with Pauly Shore and Pauly's family owned the, you know, the comedy store. So I've run in with Joe, he's like, you know, I'm obviously a huge fan. What's he like? Is he a good dude to work with? I mean, like, is it, is it almost like the Dolphins and the Jets? It's like, oh, it's Jets week. You know, you get kind of excited, like, you know, when you oh, know yeah. that you got a week coming up with Joe. No doubt about it. It always feels bigger when he's there. There's a different dynamic to the broadcast booth when he is there. It shows you how far mixed martial arts still has to come, though, that mm. he hasn't been nominated for a national sports Emmy because mm, he's the point. preeminent analyst in mixed martial arts, and he has been for years, and he's very good at his job balancing the comedy with the analytics and everything else. And without being classically trained in television, it's amazing what he's accomplished. I mean, he truly is the greatest of all time and yet doesn't really get anything resembling a sniff in terms of national acknowledgement. And I think that's just because MMA is still in its relative infancy in this com in this country. And candidly, Joe doesn't give a shit, right? Yeah. If any of that acknowledgement comes his way, but he is a special dude. And yes, he's a genuine, genuine guy. And I probably should have led with that, that he's probably a better human being than he even is as a broadcaster, you know, just the way he treats the crew and the people around him. And it's hard being Joe Rogan, right? Like it's hard getting to that level of celebrity and knowing that basically every American man, if they could sit down with three other people right. before they die, right. they would want to give you a seat. Right. Never right. mind, take right. a picture with you, right? right. So right. it's right. hard going through life as Joe Rogan. I give him a lot of respect for the way he handles that navigation. Yeah, yeah Joe Rogan, I mean, Joe Rogan is the poster child for fuck you money. And, you know, um, to which is a testament to how cool the UFC is because the poster child for fuck you money is still doing this job and still loving it, right? That's how much he loves what he's doing. And yeah. it's a lesson. Like, if you don't love what you're doing, just don't do it. Yeah. You know? Well, and that's a big part of my initiative is to make sure that he keeps loving it so that he sticks around. And I've mm. said publicly, he's probably going to outlast me. Just family-wise, we're at different stages in our life. I have three little kids. I've been away 100 nights a year for the last 12 years, right? Mm. And, you know, sometimes he'll come in on Friday, whereas maybe I'm there on Tuesday devoting my whole week to it. So it's sort of a different navigation, but I want him to be happy. And I believe he has never had more fun doing this job than right now. And mm. that's not trying to put myself over. I think DC deserves a lot of credit for that too. But I think if you had him here, he would say, yeah, I've never had more fun doing this job and I want to do it for a long time. And uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully from his mouth to God's ears. To, to go back into the UFC for a second, just because I have you, I have to ask you this. Um, how did it feel 
to sort of see John Jones dominate in the way that he did because there was so much lead up to that fight, three years in the making or however long he was out of the ring or out of the cage. And, you know, we were expecting at least a round, right? Like we weren't expecting 40 seconds, one kick in the nuts, and then a guillotine game over. Like, was that for you? Oh, okay, that's that's how good he is. Or, you know, like, what what was your kind of thinking, like the little guy in your head telling you when that happened the way that it happened? Well, it's a combination of things. I'm not sure that I would have uttered greatest of all time right after mm. a fighter wins a fight, but I think we were all so stunned in the moment. And upon further reflection, there's a lot of venom being directed at Seattle Gone, the opposition in this case, and I think rightfully so. Mm. I don't want to take away anything for what John Jones was able to do to come back from three years away and to do to Seattle Gone what no other heavyweight has been able to do in terms of submitting him. I would say two things. Number one, it's a short amount of fight time, and Seattle Gone's defensive grappling left a lot to be desired. <laughs> but I would also say that even though John Jones hadn't had a submission since 2012, there's a lot of elite fighters, Kamaru Usman, Bilal mm. Muhammad, who don't necessarily have a signature choke or a signature submission when they get you on the ground. You know, Daniel Cormier has two head-to-head -head wins over the late great Anthony Rumble Johnson because he has submission offense. Once mm. he was able to get Rumble down, he knows how to choke you the fuck out of there, right? So say what you want about Seattle gone in defeat. But John Jones was able to let go of the guillotine, adjust, get it again, and then force Seattle gone to tap. So all hail John Jones. I do believe he's the greatest mixed martial arts athlete I've ever seen. But I do think he's going to have to be in better shape than he was going into this fight to beat Stipe Miocic this July. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, because I'm, you know, as a fan, I'm like, you know, can anybody compete with this guy? I mean, he just walked in there, you know, did his thing, did his little dance, did his little goat thing. And it's like, uh -huh. we never even saw the fight. You know, it's like, we're still all the questions we had before the fight started, we still have, right? Like, well, and I think for John too, Mark, right? I don't think he loved the way he felt on the feet early on, but mentally, I'm not sure there's a sharper athlete on the roster, and I'm sure mm. you didn't see our post show, but when he absorbed that groin strike seven seconds in, groin strike didn't bother him, but he knew it was illegal, he knew it was on the pills, and he didn't want that strike to go unnoticed. No, no, so, I've heard you say that, I've heard you say that, yeah, yeah. So the fact that after three years away, bro, that mentally he's so acutely locked in, right, that seven seconds in, he's not thinking about groin strike, oh, immediately we're not going to let this strike go unnoticed by the referee. And I just think it speaks to just his overall greatness. And the other thing, too, that John doesn't get enough credit for is just his coachability. We mm. see him as this sort of arrogant type who, you know, hits pregnant ladies with his car and drives away and has all these out-of-octagon <laughs> transgressions. Right. But yet... Some this, recently, supposedly, with, like, the Twitter stuff. Yes. <laughs> but this guy, man, you know, he treats a lot of our fan base and a lot of our staff and a lot of his coaches like gold and he's a sponge when it comes to mixed martial arts knowledge and then executing a strategy, right? Like he's not some renegade when he goes in there, does exactly what his coaches want him to. So I don't want to lean too much into a three minute fight, but, um, but I think that Jones is the best heavyweight in the world. I just think he's going to have to be better against Stipe. Physically, he's going to have to be better. And I think Stipe is obviously going to extend him longer than a round. And like, you know, the fanboy in me is coming back out again, but um, this idea of International Fight Week and a potential main card of Jones, Stipe, and, um, you know, another championship of Colby, Leon on the same card with both of those guys on stage that also have some weird history because they were roommates and such. I mean, that could be the card to end all cards if, they, if they're able to actually pull that off. I would agree. I would say there is a 1% chance only that Colby <laughs> Covington and Leon Edwards fight during International Fight Week. I think right. short of them offering Leon just an obscene amount of money, there's no reason for him to turn around that quickly. And sure, sure. It was a grueling five-round fight with Kamaru, even though Leon didn't absorb a lot of damage, right? Mm. It's still a mental and a physical grind, and uh, the back-to-back -back training camps for Kamaru. I just think if I'm Leon Edwards, I'm looking fourth quarter at the very earliest. Right, right, because, right, do you see a possibility? This is what me and my buddies were all riffing about. Um, do you see a possibility of a possible interim Colby kind of getting his second interim title shot 
with him and Bilal as the interim. If 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 uh, if Leon says, "Hey, I don't want to fight," then you know Dana, who's like you know the king, says, well, "Okay, well, you know you you know you're going the Nganu route. I'm gonna give an interim title shot to Colby Bilal, make that a gigantic fight, and then you know a true number one contender emerges." I like the way you think, and that would determine a true number one contender. And it would align calendar-wise. You could have those guys fight in July and then potentially close out the year with a UFC welterweight title unification bout. But you need Colby Covington to sign on the dotted line, and I'm not trying to uh, you know, fire any more bullets his way, but I don't think Colby Covington's going to accept the Bilal Muhammad fight. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, let me sort of bring it back to my sort of world a little bit. Um, what's what's your take on technology? Do you game? Are you into the sort of, um, you know, all this new kind of stuff that's happening in AI? Have you ever, you know, have you leveraged any of that stuff? Like, what's your sort of perception with the way that technology, especially in the last three years, has evolved so much and become such an incredibly powerful tool, even beyond the years before, right? Yeah. I think you have no choice but to embrace it, right? Or it's going to pass you by. And I even remember when non-fungible tokens all of a sudden were establishing. (laughs) Daniel Cormier calling me three years ago. He's like, dude, we got to get Rogan to do an NFT, dude. I'm telling you, we'll make so much money, you know. And that was way over my head at the time. But certainly in terms of the AI and the meta stuff, there's been a huge embrace on the UFC side. And I think you're going to see that over the next 24 months if you haven't started to see it already. So there's a lot of things that I've been privy to that uh, that I can't really get into here, but I think it's sure. going to excite your audience a whole lot moving forward. So, yeah, that's um, awesome. I mean, look, Crypto.com is obviously one of the big sponsors of the UFC. I think the UFC was probably the first major American sport to have NFTs and stuff like that. You know, um, I've I got lucky. I bought my first Bitcoin at nine dollars way way back in the day. You know, for me, what's kind of blowing my mind now is all this sort of generative art AI like stable yeah. diffusion and the beauty of it being an open source software, right? Like there's two kind of camps in technology. Now there's like the open source stuff and the closed stuff, which is traditionally what's been around. And I think for the first time ever, really the open source stuff is just as good as the closed stuff, you know? And I think that that's going to have incredibly wide implications, you know, moving forward. But anyway, um, that's a total weird tangent, but, um, You've given me more time than I thought you were going to give me. And I'm so grateful to have you on the show, John. Like, I'm I'm a huge fan. I listen to your podcast every week. And every time, obviously, you do it. Like, there hasn't been a show that you've done that I've missed in a very, very long time. You know? Well, so- thank you, man. It, it really means a lot. And uh, the podcast for me is a tremendous conduit to not only get things off my chest, especially after a week like I had last week, but Mm. I'm not sure there's any better way for me to give back to a fan base that has given me so much, right? Like that show will never be behind a paywall. The video, the audio will never be behind a paywall. I feel like it's, it's free content that I can give to the fans all over the world. And given how much they have supported me, it's like the least I can do. So thank you. You know, the, the, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but but the angle of your podcast, the format of it is very geared towards this kind of sort of emergent phenomenon that's happened in all of sports recently, which is this kind of sharp or square kind of sort of betting analysis of understanding, you know, the odds and, and really trying to give the audience a, a, a opinion on where to potentially invest their very hard earned money. Was this like a conscious thing that you wanted to sort of focus in on? Because it seems like your brain when it comes to understanding the sort of gambling side or, you know, maybe gambling is not the right word, but the, you know, the betting side of the sport yeah. is just on another level. Well, gambling's genetic. It's in my blood. My grandfather was sneaking us into casinos when we were very young. I've Mm. essentially been betting on sports every day since 1996. And when we launched our podcast in April of 2015, largely the format has gone unchanged. Certainly there has been this worldwide embrace of sports betting. And even in my most enthusiastic wild dream, I didn't expect it to be embraced to this extent. 
but it certainly worked out for us because for years we were making picks on our show and we have a very meat and potatoes format. We recap a show. We have Ray Longo as a coach who is off of his fucking rocker and he has his own segment. And then we do picks and we have a professional handicapper make picks against former three-time UFC title challenger Kenny Florian. We've been doing that for eight years. It just so happens that now everybody else is seemingly doing it. So DraftKings bought our podcast and right, right. it just very much dovetails with what our vision is. But at the end of the day, bro, as a broadcaster, first and foremost, I have always looked at this as just another lens through which to look at these sporting events, right? Mm. Israel Adesanya is fighting Alex Pereira in a rematch in Miami on April 8th, live on pay-per-view. These men have met three times in combat sports before. Now they're meeting for a fourth. Adesanya hasn't beaten him one time and he's the betting favorite. How come, right? Right, And I think if people aren't even looking at that as a lens you're leaving something on the table oh man i can't wait to listen to that podcast which is coming up soon it's not this i think the ufc is off this weekend right but next weekend you get to do a show in your home state in your adopted state how does that feel this is the first because i believe the ufc hasn't been in florida since 2012 or something so um this is your first ufc show in your home state correct Well, this is a home game. I mean, you know South Florida is different than Jacksonville, Tampa, Orlando, even Hollywood and Sunrise with respect. There's Miami and everything else. We haven't been to Miami since 2003. There's been Hollywood and Orlando. Jacksonville, obviously, we went during the pandemic. Yep, But this is the first time, right, but this is the first time in Miami. And uh, yeah, 45, 50 minutes from my front door. I'm very excited. Well, I live in the Florida Keys. Um, you know, I'm actually going to be in New York City for a while starting uh, this weekend. So I'm kind of going back into the lion's den. But if you're ever in the Florida Keys and want to get on a boat and go fishing for, uh, you know, for sailfish or whatever, you know, you know how to find me, John. This has been amazing, man. I'm so grateful to you. And I'm so thankful that somebody with your talent is the voice of me listening to these fights for five, six hours on a Saturday. You know, you've you've done some great stuff and and all the love to you, all the love to your family and hopefully everything, uh, um, you know, continues to, you know, to be great for you. Thank you very much. Thank you, man. No, I appreciate your time and it means a lot. And uh, this is why we do it, right? And just trying to be as listenable as possible for seven hours. And uh, we appreciate your viewership very much. And maybe we'll put something in the water at some point down there (laughs) in the keys, we'll see. Do, Do you live close to the water? Yeah, I'm like 20 minutes from the beach, you know? So, I mean, I'm pretty west, like in the Everglades. I mean, Colby Covington told the whole world I live in Boca Raton, (laughs) so it's not a secret now. Um, But we're pretty far west, but yet only 20 minutes from the beach. So So look, I must confess, I was listening to your latest uh, episode of, of your podcast, and I did hear about the situation that you're having with the internet. And I have seen you freeze a couple times, and I do have some advice for you. Okay, as a technology guy who, you know, owns a VR development studio, I've owned video game companies, I have some advice. So two things. One, not to give them a plug because God knows they don't need it. Xfinity one gigabyte internet is a must have and they have great service in Florida. Do you have that? Yes. Okay, so you're already there with them. Okay, number two, the Xfinity, the white modem that they give you it's like a kind of white tall modem, right? Yeah. Is that, yep. is that what you have? Yep. Okay. You take an ethernet cable and you connect it from that modem to whatever computer you do your broadcasting from at home. Okay. You're already doing that? Yeah, hardwire, but not to the modem, to a router. So I can no, bring no, the no, modem see, upstairs. Yes, it has to be directly from the modem. Forget the router thing. That That's just some other company trying to add, it's like a game of telephone, right? They're just, they're, they're creating a blocker between you and the signal. So it degradates your signal. So you do not want that. What you want is to go direct from the actual white little modem that you get yep. from Xfinity into your computer. Even if you need to have somebody come in and, and like install a new jack on the wall so that you can move it from wherever it is to a more convenient place, you want your little white modem direct into your computer. You do a speed check and you should be getting between 800 and 900 uh you know kilobits per second if you're not something is wrong um i just wanted to give you that little no, bit because thank I, you because i know i've been listening to your show i know you've been kind of struggling with it the guys are making fun of you about it 
So, you know, like, I just wanted to throw that out there. Well, I came downstairs to do your show today to get closer to the modem. Our download speed's not the issue. The upload speed is the sure. issue. The audio seemingly is clean, but every time I start bouncing around, the video <laughs> freezes. So thank you. I'm going to try to hardwire to the modem today and see if that solves my issues. I think it'll do a great help to, to eliminate that sort of middleman of the router. Well, thank you, my brother. I appreciate his, it very much. His name is John Anik. Check him out on the Anik and Florian podcast. And thank you very much, sir, and bless.